Good afternoon. Welcome to what will surely be the only workshop or session where the chair refuses to chew the chocolate currently residing in the roof of his mouth. This is a policy that I've had for uh, several decades. Uh, I encourage you all to try it. Uh, Sakiris, I'm not sponsored by Sakiris, I have no financial interest in Sakiris, but they do have a big block of Hague's chocolate, best chocolate in the world, and if you use the chisel right, you can get a spit that fits the top of your mouth perfectly. And uh, it's darkest chocolate, so it's taking a while to leave. So, unfortunately, the first speaker has uh, a surname that starts with S, which is problematic at this moment, but uh, Dr Tim Semple. So, uh, we're very lucky in Adelaide to, uh, to have Tim and Pam uh, driving two aspects of our pain services. Uh, I'm, because I work in the persistent pain space, I'm more familiar with, with Tim's contribution to this uh, field for our state, and it, it is truly remarkable and indefatigable, Tim Semple. Uh, I, any opportunity I get to just say thank you on behalf of our state, Tim, I'd, I'd take that opportunity to say thank you on behalf of our state. Uh, I don't, I, you can read the bio online. Um, Tim's probably only got about 45 minutes of material. I think Pam's about the same. So if we play everything right and you don't ask any questions, we'll get out really early. But I'm sure it will be very appropriate to ask questions, perhaps at the end of the talks, looking for a nod. Yeah, is that better? Yep. OK. Uh, Tim, all yours. Thank you, Samarama. Thank you. Nice and bright. Um, thank you, and thanks to the uh, organisers for inviting me and giving me a little bit of free reign. Um, I, I chose the title Dupe Date, uh, sorry, Dated, Dupe, Disabled and Dishonest because it just it seemed to roll off the tongue really well. And it did uh, describe what we see in working in the pain clinic world at times where there's some pretty ab and unusual prescribing comes through our doors. Um, need to do the conflict of interest uh, declaration. I've uh, uh, done presentations with uh, a number of the pharmaceutical companies. I've been on the, the board of the Pain Society and Pain Australia, and I'm currently president of a charity that uh, organises PhDs for pain research. But my background, for those who don't know me, is that I've continued to work half-time in anaesthesia and pain medicine for, well, it's over 26 years now in this uh, nearby public hospital. I've got the usual qualifications, and I quote uh, that I'm not an FCO, I'm not a fellow of the College of Oxycontology. Uh, it would almost seem from my career trajectory over the last 20 years that that's been the major topic of discussion between me and patients. So, when we hear about uh, anaesthesia changing the uh, professional title to anaesthesiology, pain medicine isn't going to go down the pathway of oxycontology. So defining the, the four Ds of dangerous prescribing, and this has been around a long time, um, the four Ds of dangerous prescribing, and it's referring primarily to prescribing in the community, and that's going to be the focus of my talk. And, I'll leave the more acute pain side of things to uh, uh, my colleague Pam. So dated is not keeping up with the changing standards or new evidence. Duped is easily uh, manipulated in a recurring pattern. Disabled is when the pre prescriber has got impaired judgment due to illness or drugs or alcohol. And dishonest is when you use your medical licence as a franchise to deal drugs. And I'd encourage anyone who's got a moment to um, Google corrupt prescribing in the USA. If you put those terms in, you'll find some fascinating examples of dishonest behaviours. Uh, I haven't, didn't see any from Australia when I was doing my Google search, um, but it was fascinating that in fact, for in the old days, a few years ago, when there were pill mills in Florida, where services were set up solely to prescribe opiates, um, they were actually sending out seekers to Narcotics Anonymous groups around the country and encouraging people to move to Florida so they could become a patient of the pill mill and to maintain the flow. Um, fortunately, that's not going on anymore. Just to quickly mention duped, and I'm not going to cover this too much, but I think uh, as someone who's worked 
for half my uh, working week in, uh, in the pain medicine area for nigh on 30 years. I suspect I've been duped and I think all clinicians at different times will be duped and I think it's something to, uh, it's very difficult to avoid. What I am going to focus upon really is evidence and dated prescribing and how we have the challenge in this area of keeping up with the new evidence. And I think it's one of the areas in which my, my time working in the pain medicine field um, and my time working in anaesthesia have moved sort of further and further apart. Um, one of the things from an anaesthesia viewpoint is that the training you have in anaesthesia when it comes to clinical pharmacology I think is greater than just about any other medical specialty out there. We train people from an RACGP background, we train people from a, a rehab medicine background uh, and we train anaesthetists in the pain area and our anaesthetic uh, trainees have a different approach to pharmacology. They're far more focused on side effects, you know, for anaesthesia, safety, dealing with safety side effects. They're far more focused on that. And it takes a while with the candidates from other areas or medical disciplines to see the pharmacological focus that um, you get from an anaesthetic background. And I think perhaps that's one of the rationales for why we've seen Amongst anaesthesia, we have very, very tight prescribing in, the, in our operating theatres. We're very, very conscious of safety and all of the side effect profiles of our medications. And I think we sort of, uh, uh, anaesthesia as a discipline is certainly way up there ahead of the others. The four Ds has been um, criticised by some reporters and Deneen and Dubois from uh, the American uh, Journal of Law and Medicine last year said, uh, put up the, the, the suggestion that it's better to use the three C's, casual, corrupt and compromise, with casual to cover uh, evidence that is dated and duped. And they thought there were some, particularly in the medical legal environment in the USA, uh, that the term casual was perhaps better than dated. Just to cover things, the areas that we see, the drugs that you will see as an anaesthetist that may look out of place on the patient's drug chart when they come into hospital. We see fentanyl patches used to a high extent. We've got a lot of Oxycontin still out there, although that's diminishing. When it comes to the benzos, Xanax or Alprazolam, lots of diazepam and clonazepam seem to come up in, in, in amounts that we get surprised at. And, for us all, pre-gabalin is getting more and more used, more and more prescribed, and indeed, I think in the UK, there's a, a, a bit of a talk to make that a S8 or an authorised drug because of the risks of misuse. And just for anaesthetists, I thought I'd throw this in, that this is when you start Googling interesting prescribing. So if we go to Medscape earlier this year, um, the emergency physicians are talking about using propofol in the emergency department for difficult to treat headaches. And I think most anaesthetists would have really quivered at the thought of this, uh, uh, seeing the, the chronic headache patients bouncing into an ED department for increments of, um, increments of propofol. And they say, when you, uh, when you go to the articles, they, they say, well, we're not quite sure how it works, but it seems to. It's extremely safe, it's not sedating and it does allow very rapid ED turnover and it's much quicker than any other form of pain treatment so we can get them in, give them some propofol and get them out within 20 minutes. Um, let's just hope that this form of prescribing doesn't end up in our EDs. So just to throw it back to a patient scenario and, and this is the sort of thing that uh, people would talk to me about, um, uh, I'd come across in my practice, is that we're, we're asked to anaesthetise the standard 45 year old male for debridement of the ischemic ulcers in the left hand. He's presented to ED with a painful dusky limb after an inadvertent intra-arterial injection of his MS Contin. Um, this could be coming from Darwin, uh, but maybe not. Um, the case note review reveals that he's had several prior ED attendances with overdoses. He's needed resuscitation, but then he's self-discharged. He's had admissions for cellulitis. But he remains on a long-term prescription of MS Contin, 100 milligrams twice a day for back pain. And you really wonder why this is going on. And the questions that we have, and this one is perhaps the extreme example that I've used just to pull in a few of the issues, is why would this man still be out there on a high-dose opiate uh, for low back pain? 
And why is he still being prescribed after a previous OD and probably likely IV drug use uh, related cellulitis? Who'd prescribe this and why would they still be doing? And as someone working in the hospital setting as an anaesthetist, what can you do to contribute positively to this or at least cause more harm? And I'll come back to this case at the end. What I did want to do, though, is to provide a bit of a background as to how we got to where we are with uh, opiate prescribing in 2018. Because it's a, it's a fascinating journey and it mirrors my career. I started working in the pain area in the late 1980s and, and there were great things happening. Uh, acute pain management was starting up that, at that stage. The cancer pain interventional options were starting up. The options there were much greater. And so in the chronic pain management, we were, we were coming a bit behind, but we, uh, we jumped onto the same bandwagon. That's a photo of Russell Portnoy from the States, and he published that uh, it was, it's repeatedly quoted as the entry point, the beginning of why opiates began to be used in the chronic pain setting, and that opiates can be, uh, can be safe, they can uh, be salutary, and they can be humane and that the numbers who get addicted are very, very low. And uh, I was working in that field, just starting there about 1990, and we thought this was great. Um, we, thought we, we thought there were no knowns, uh, and just to quote Donald Runsfeld, because it fitted in really well. We've heard a bit about the knowns earlier from Lorimer, and this is just a different version of quoting no knowns, etc. But when I started working in this area, I think we felt very confident that we knew all we needed to know about opiates. Uh, I, I, I remember talking with my colleagues and we had a good understanding, we had pain scores, we had respiratory, or we, we could measure sedation, we could do a few things. We uh, knew that we could use slow release opiates, but we needed to treat constipation and watch for some of the side effects. We didn't realise what, uh, uh, th there were going to be some known unknowns, things we didn't know, but what really got us was the things that we didn't, just didn't know that we didn't know. And that's what came out over the next few years. And this is the area that I want to uh, sort of explore with you and explain why we're here today. I quite like these uh, over, um, graphs that I acquired a few years ago. And, they're a little bit messy, but they show a period of uh, four or five or seven years, in fact, and state by state. And, oh, sorry, let's come back. This is the one for pethidine. Um, we can just see that over the period 98 to 2005, pethidine use went down very significantly. It's fascinating that the Northern Territory was way up there for, for reasons that I'll talk about uh, in a moment, uh, but indeed, Evidence, we, we learned all about where pethidine uh, didn't fit in and good prescribing changes occurred. Around about the same time though, opiate prescribing went up and it went up and went up. And the figures in Australia match those in the USA. Uh, opiate prescribing from 92 up to 2012 started to take off in uh, around about the turn of the century, uh, around about 2000, that's when uh, uh, prescriptions tended to go up and this is when uh, it seemed to become more acceptable in the in the primary care setting to use these medications. For our interest the Australian government uh, spent about 270 million dollars back in 2012 on these medications subsidising uh, them. In the community uh, if you're watching your TV and you've got pain the message we get is to take a painkiller and very clearly, if it's severe, you go and see your doctor and get a stronger painkiller. And um, one of Lorimer's strong messages is, has been about educating people. And one of our challenges when we educate our community and the people for who, who come to see us for pain management is, is knowing where they're coming from. And if this is the mass media message that they have, uh, that a pill will cure you, um, we're facing some challenges. I think we all need and want instant gratification um, and we want it now and uh, we're all time short. Um, if we're the prescriber or the doctor, we want to be able to assess and treat rapidly. It would be nice to have a treatment that we think will help our patient. If we're the patient, it would be lovely to have a treatment that we can get rapidly and immediately. 
Uh, and interesting as an anaesthetist, on my anaesthetic uh, half of my life or my week, I really enjoy the uh, immediate gratification of providing anaesthesia. And I know that with a syringe in my hand and a patient, I can achieve unconsciousness rapidly. Uh, I can provide safe anaesthesia care over a day and I can go home and I can feel gratified. I've, I've completed my circle of care with these patients and that's great. My pain clinic days are very different. The gratification is much slower. Sometimes it isn't gratifying, but uh, no, most of the time it is very gratifying, but it is much slower. So the challenge as a community, as both prescribers, health providers and recipients of healthcare, is that we all do want a quick fix. We want to take a painkiller or get a, a miracle new operation. A miracle new operation would be wonderful. We've got very limited public health messaging and consumer acceptance for the alternatives for non-pharmacological options for self-management, education, allied health. Um, we see really strong public messages, health messages out there in the community about taking care of our skin in the sun, uh, looking after our mental health, uh, driving safely, wearing uh, seat belts, doing all these things. We don't have uh, looking after yourself from a pain viewpoint uh, and looking after medications. Our, our healthcare system, our Medicare model, does provide incentives for short consultations, prescribing, referring, ordering x-rays. Uh, those GPs who spend more time talking with their patients, explaining and reassuring, uh, are penalised uh, financially. And indeed, the PBAC looks at them and sends them notes to say, you are atypical from your peers, you need to do more shorter consults. And similarly, our PBS will subsidise prescriptions but it won't provide uh, Medicare support for allied health. And this is one of Lorimer's uh, great um, concerns, and I think we're all working upon this at a federal level. We're trying to get the current Medicare review changed to get more Medicare support for allied health to manage chronic pain. So coming back to the pathway, to the trajectory, by 2001 at Royal Brisbane, 83% of their referrals were on opiates. Uh, when sent to their pain clinic. And it was clear at that point that the opiates were being prescribed instead of appropriate alternative non-pharmacological therapies for uh, chronic non-cancer pain. Coming back to the, uh, the slides of uh, what was happening around that time, it was interesting that Queensland took up OxyContin in the highest formulation most rapidly uh, for reasons that we don't quite understand and I think, I think what the next few slides show is that there were cultural differences around Australia about prescribing. It wasn't evidence-based. There wasn't one particular medication that, that uh, was the uh, favourite for the country. Each region seemed to have a, a different flavour to its prescribing. If you were in northern Tasmania, um, you were likely to be on a whole lot of, a whole lot of methadone tablets. North, northern Tasmania seems to be uh, was the home at that period for methadone tablet prescribing for chronic pain. This is one of the slides I find really most entertaining. Um, the thing about this slide is that we actually note the units on the side there are, are, are different from the former slides. The former slides are of the order of 100 units or 50 units. So for MS Conton prescribing in the Northern Territory, uh, back around the... Uh, 1999, or they were prescribing more MS Contin 100 milligram tablets than all of New South Wales. So, with a population difference of uh, 120,000 to uh, four or five million, it was quite a significant difference. And this, this seemed to be in the setting that there was not a dependency program, and that it's likely that a lot of this medicine was not uh, being prescribed for pain at that stage. Um, the rationale for this is. Uh, I'm not sure if you could call it dated. I think uh, it was uh, possibly an element of uh, practitioners looking at what was available in the community to treat people and choosing to go down a certain pathway. So coming back to how do we get there, um, Rathnell and Carr published this some uh, 15 years ago and they talk about evidence and science and the rational use of when you intervene to provide a treatment. 
And it applies to both interventional pain treatments, but it also applies to some of our medications. And we all know that when a new medication comes on the market, the goal is to prescribe it in the first couple of years because that's before the side effects appear. That's when it works best. Um, so there seems to be a 10 year delay to, to confirm or refute the value of anything. So to, uh, 20 years on down the track, what, what have we learned? When did the evidence actually catch up uh, with the practice? Well, it was about 2004 to 2008 that the systematic reviews came out and the meta-analyses appeared. And, and we began to learn that the efficacy of opiates wasn't as great as we expected. So in the chronic pain setting, the first quotes were of a number needed to treat to get benefit was about 2.5. Two out of five would benefit to some extent. Um, and as an anaesthetist, that's quite hard to take because as an anaesthetist, I have an expectation that the anaesthetic agents I use have an NNT of one. I don't expect to be able to have to explain to the patient that the induction agent I'm going to use to put you to sleep has got a number needed to treat of 2.5 and that so you've got a one chance in two and a half of not going to sleep and at that point I'll go to the drawer trial a different drug, and then maybe go on to a third. The muscle relaxant may or may not work, um, but we've got a, a range of pills in our, or, or drugs in our cabinet to trial. So from an anaesthetic viewpoint, um, we need to have an NNT of one. In, in the, the rest of the community and for prescribing, NNTs are, are much, much higher than this. Our community does expect our medicines to work, and I think our community, our, our patients, have a tendency to believe that the NNT of any medicine that's supported by the government under the PBS has an NNT of one. They will all work. And that's hence the term painkillers. They will kill your pain, this medicine. They will kill it better if you have more. That was possibly the misconstruction uh, uh, con uh, uh, that uh, led to some of the problems. So the term painkiller was wrong. Um, it was fascinating. It took till 2010 that our pain literature talked about low, moderate and high doses of opiates. So opiates were about the only medicine that we could prescribe on a long-term basis in the community where the guidelines didn't actually tell us what was low, what was high, what was medium, what was mainstream. Guidelines for dosage were not around and in fact the uh, uh, MPS were the first national government or in international government body to actually publish um, a, a, a dose range. The other concept that began to come out was the concept of morphine equivalent daily dose or MED. And I think, again, this is one of the really core issues that we've, we've learnt over the last few years, is that um, we need to be able to standardise an opiate dose. We need to understand what the strength of the dose that the patient is on. And, and uh, the, the example with fentanyl patches has been one of the greatest for the lack of understanding that this small patch that just says 75 or 100 is about uh, the equivalent of uh, 250 to 400 milligrams of morphine a day. So what changed? Well, the evidence for benefit was less than expected. Um, this, this is very disappointing when you worked in the field. It was pretty obvious that it was happening, that we weren't getting the results we were hoping to get. But it was disappointing because as a provider of pain relief, you were really hoping to have some tools that would work. And we were beginning to realise that the tools weren't working very well. And we were beginning to see the evidence of harm. And the, the evidence of harms became more and more apparent. So it was this slow burn, this slow growth that when you're working in the pain clinic setting, you uh, weren't achieving as much as you hoped to with your pain, opiate pain medicines, and you were hearing about harms. Uh, and I think that's where pain medicine, um, in the chronic pain setting, uh, we began to uh, move away from the, you know, the, the acute pain treatments. We, we began to be more fearful of our opiates. Opiates are appropriate in the acute pain setting, they're far less appropriate in the chronic pain setting. We began to learn things such as this, that there's a relationship between opioid dose and use and fractures in the older chronic pain patient. And so that if you're on more than 50 milligrams oral morphine equivalents per day, you have a twofold increase in fracture risk. risk. And so one in 10 people on opiates at a dose greater than 50 milligrams will have a fracture each year. So that was 2009. 
we learned about the opioid neuroendocrine effects. And this was quite, um, it, it did come as a, quite a surprise, the suppression of the hypothalamic pituitary axis, the reduction of fertility, libido and drive, weight gain and fluid retention, uh, hypotestosteronism, amenorrhea. In fact, the, the guys from Perth, uh, Lindy Roberts et al, were the, one of the first publishers in this area in 2002, and osteoporosis. So there are a series of side effects that we just weren't expecting. Some of the uh, other factors that we weren't expecting, and this is what fits in with the neuroimmune work that Lorimer referred to earlier, uh, and that uh, Mark Hutchison has also been doing, is that this was a, it was a study, it followed low back pain patients for two years, 355 patients with low back pain followed for two years. So it's a pretty solid study. Um, and they found that in this group, if you increase the opioid dose above this 50 milligrams morphine equivalence daily dose, depression significantly worsened. You started out not depressed, and if the dose of opiates went up, you became clinically depressed. And it, the concept was opioid-induced neuroinflammatory changes. So the glial activation, uh, the toll receptor effects, led to a depressive state. And if you entered into uh, being prescribed opiates uh, uh, when you had an existing depression or anxiety disorder, uh, your medications didn't work. So in this, again, this, this study went over about uh, three years, I think, and um, they noticed that prospectively, uh, prospectively measured anxiety, depression, uh, and with low back pain, uh, this patient group responded very poorly to opiate analgesia. They had 50% less analgesic effect compared with people who weren't depressed or anxious. Uh, the patients didn't feel they had benefited and they were at risk of five times the opiate misuse. And this began to reinforce the concept that, um, I mean, we all understand that when we're, un when we're depressed or we're anxious and we have a pain condition, um, and we don't have the uh, depression or anxiety adequately treated, it's going to be much harder to treat your pain condition. And if opiates get put into that mix, your anxiety condition might even worsen. And we found out back in 2011 that, long, that opiates can change the brain and they can rapidly change the brain. And this is where functional MRI has become really interesting. This was just a small study. 10 chronic low back pain patients given oral morphine, uh, somewhere between 50 and 100 milligrams uh, per day for four weeks and then ceased. So they had a functional MRI at baseline. They had one at one month and one at four months. And there was a control group having no opioids. And we saw gray matter changes after just four weeks. There were dose uh, related volume changes in the amygdala. There were volume increases in the hypothalamus. There were structural and functional changes. What was really interesting was that the changes were sustained at four months. So you take your dose of opiate for one month, you have your MRI and the changes that have already occurred within that one month period are sustained for three months. So this does raise some, uh, some concerns that perhaps in some people the changes do take a long time to reverse, even from a relatively short-term use. And this cartoon might be a bit unfair, but it's worthwhile throwing it in. Just one tiny prick and then a lifetime of addiction. No, that's probably going a bit too far. Um, but the catch-22 of opiates, and this was particularly relevant in the chronic pain world, was that everyone does become tolerant. But some individuals will get increased pain caused by the opiates, potentially opiate hyperalgesia. And again, Lorimer alluded to that uh, in his presentation. And, you know, why does pain get worse on opiates? Um, it's the elephant in the room. I'm there and no one acknowledges me. One of the papers that's been out for 10 years now, but I do find it really interesting as an anaesthetist because um, it does put some things into pers uh, perspective. Um, we do have a perception that our chronic pain patients are more sensitive to interventions, painful, they're more sensitive to pain and to painful interventions when they come to hospital for procedures. I think we're all aware of 
trying to put the IV into the person who is very, very sensitive to, to having the IV put in. They respond a lot more than we expect for other people. Uh, and perhaps, uh, you know, we jump to the conclusion that that's, that's the chronic pain patient, that's the chronic pain syndrome, that's the psychological factors. This paper is, it takes that, looks at it differently. And again, they did the 300 plus patients and they measured the pain and unpleasantness of uh, patients with chronic pain following one mil of subdermal local anaesthetic via a 25 gauge needle. So this was people about to have a spinal injection of some sort, facet joint injection or epidural, and they got the 25 gauge needle in the skin, one mil. They also had the 27 control. So they measured the level of pain and distress against the opioid dose and the opioid dose duration. And once the oral morphine equivalent daily dose got above 30 milligrams, there was significantly greater, uh, where's my, uh, yeah. In that group number three, there were a group of above 30 milligrams oral morphine per day. They got much, much higher levels of uh, injection unpleasantness and pain. And equally, once the uh, opioid dosing had been there for more than a year, again, there was significantly increased unpleasantness and pain. And the implication is that the pain is potentially caused by being on opiates, that putting the needle in will hurt more if you've been on opiates. Uh, the longer you've been on them and the higher the dose, the more it will hurt. So to some extent, we might have been giving these people an iatrogenic pain disorder. Um, those people with chronic pain uh, who were in the trial who weren't on opiates did not have the same levels. So. To me, it puts that, uh, the, the concept of opiate hyperalgesia into perspective that potentially it does exist. We are causing pain by prescribing these drugs, which makes me wonder a lot about what I've done in previous years. The other one that came out was death. And death is one of the big concerns in the area of prescription opiates. And this paper from a few years back talks about mortality after lumbar fusion surgery. And again, it was 2,400 patients, lumbar fusion surgery in the late 90s. They looked at the deaths over the next five years. Who died? Well, young people who had their spinal fusion generally died. Um, and it was mainly related to opiates. So the, those people who remained on opiates were the ones who were likely to die after their operation over the next five years. And we've seen a succession of, uh, uh, of reports come out that um, prescription opiates, if prescribed uh, for in, in the wrong settings, can be associated with death. And as anaesthetists, we we're incredibly focused on safety. Um, there's been a lot of talks about safety today. And our safety levels in the operating theatre are very, very high. Um, we, uh, we, we tell our patients that for a, you know, ASA1 patient having an elective procedure, uh, their risks of, of having significant harm are far, far, uh, are, are very, very low, and the chances of dying uh, from being hit by a car are much, much higher. Well, we now got the chances of dying from a prescription drug overdose is higher than that car accident <laughs> from being hit by a car. Uh, the prescription opiates have, have jumped up, uh, prescription medications have jumped up to that. This came out in the Pennington report uh, in 2016. Accidental drug overdoses kill more people than road deaths. Um, the drug that's at the top of the, or the drug group that's at the top of the list in red are the opiates. In, but uh, to be fair, it's usually in combination. Uh, it's usually in combination with other sedatives and indeed Many of these situations, the opiates, the prescription opiates are being taken by someone for whom they're not prescribed. Um, however, they are sitting up there. So who takes the, who are being prescribed these medications? Um, I, was, um, I was a party or a contributor to the, this report, the Australian Atlas of Healthcare Variation, which came out in late 2015. And uh, chapter five is about opiates around the country. And so we saw that in uh, that year, 2013 to 14, there were 14 million prescriptions and that some parts of our country had a tenfold uh, difference in the rate of prescribing. I mean, a fascinating tenfold uh, difference in the rate of treatment with a medicine for pain between one suburb and the next. 
It's almost worth going through it because I, I do find it fascinating that it might be my geeky side. But this is the, uh, looking across the different states, and we actually see again that Tasmania won, the Central Highlands and Tasmania won as being the area in Australia that has opiates prescribed at the highest rate. Um, the northern suburbs of Adelaide came second in the country, um, uh, and uh, some of the other states were a bit less. So, but South Australia, Tasmania were way up there. When we look at, and just to focus on Adelaide, and, and this, we'll just see that the, the deeper colour blue is where the opiates are prescribed the higher. Um, so if we look at the lighter colours there, we can see the leafy eastern suburbs of Adelaide are the lowest prescribed areas for opiates uh, in the Adelaide region, and the outer, the outer northern suburbs and the outer southern suburbs are where prescribing is much higher. And so I guess this could imply that if you live in the leafy eastern suburbs, you have less pain, uh, there's less pain in the air, there's whatever's going on, something else is going on there, but you don't have pain. When we look at... Oh, sorry. Let's go back. When we look at where uh, in South Australia, we see Playford, York Peninsula, Mid-North and Gawler. They're the highest prescribing areas. So that's the outer suburbs and the inner rural. And there's very, very clear-cut population uh, elements to why this is so. And, and again, Lorimer alluded to education. And, and one of the area issues that this report shows is that it's health literacy, capacity to deal with a health system, having resources to manage your health, having education to deal with your health, relates to uh, how you deal with pain. Um, again, we see Burnside and Unley are the least prescribed, so uh, it's an interesting thing for health literacy for those areas. What do they say? Well, the health department couldn't provide any explanation for why the diversity was there, but they did surmise that the lack of available other treatment options was the factor. I do like these things because they are fascinating. So we've got people in this country who go around and collect water or collect sewerage from around the country and analyse it for how much opiate is in the sewerage. And again, if we look at fentanyl, we can see for each state, uh, when we look across the graphs there from ACT through to WA, uh, the white bars are the capital and the uh, hatch bars are from the rural areas. If you live in the country, you're going to be on, in every state, just about twofold as much opiate as you are in the city when it comes to this drug. And New South Wales likes fentanyl patches. Oxycodone, again, Victoria, rural Victoria likes oxycodone. So in the country, you're far more likely to be taking opiates. Why is this? Well, this came out uh, 2013. Uh, PBS was reviewing, was following 100,000 people, 45 and up over a period of time. Uh, we showed that uh, the, 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 the uh, review looked at this 100,000 patients. They found that 5% were on long-term opioids, 5% were on intermittent opiates. Those people on opiates smoked, had obesity, had a lower level of physical activity, had a lower income, had reduced private health insurance, were likely to be living outside a major city, although they may be living in the outer suburbs. They're far more likely to have psychological distress. So we were seeing that people being prescribed opiates were those with a lack of access to alternative treatments. Uh, I'll allude to it in my, I'll talk about it in the presentation I've got to do tomorrow, but in fact, these are the same people who present to hospital far more often for surgery than other people too, because they have to have their, they, they present looking for um, surgical interventions, colonoscopies for their constipation, uh, interventions like that. So this group of people are far more likely to make up what we see as an ethos in a public hospital setting. So it would appear that there were many social and psychological drivers of pain or life distress rather than biomedical. 
So I quoted that back in 2000 or so, there were uh, something like 82% of patients being uh, attending pain clinics uh, on opiates. Uh, the EPOC data from 2018 shows that it's 81% of our patients being referred to a pain clinic will already be on opiates with a mean oral daily dose of somewhere around 70 milligrams. So we haven't changed yet. We haven't seen the numbers drop yet, despite the evidence that's out there. But the evidence is building and the, the, the advocacy amongst uh, our politicians is building. And in fact, our, our health minister is taking interest in this. So there's a lot of, um, lot of noise out there in the media world. We've had a codeine withdrawal episodes earlier this year. We've had a national opioid crisis. The TGA is reviewed. Uh, it's S8s. We've got real-time prescribing coming in various states. Um, there's an MBS item number review going on. So we've got quite a bit of noises out there about hoping to change how things are going, such that opiates are not the first line treatment for chronic pain. We've also had our CDC guidelines, and, um, and these came out of the States um, 2016, strongest recommendations yet, um, basically saying the non-pharmacological or non-opioid treatments were generally for our common or garden uh, chronic pain states were more effective and less harmful and that we needed to be cautious once we went above 50 milligrams oral morphine per day and to work hard at avoiding doses above 90 milligrams or so. So we're now getting really strong guidelines out there for, the, um, for our communities to avoid too much for the conditions of um, back pain joint pain and the, those things that affect most people most of the time. Australian Government via New South Wales Health has put out their recommendations for general practice and again they recommend uh, trying not to go much past 40 milligrams uh, for too long. Um, this is all ideal. But I think what we really need to know as anaesthetists and also as anyone who prescribes pain relief is about what this 50 milligram morphine equivalent daily dose is. So it's the smallest fentanyl patch, somewhere around Tarjan 15 BD or Oxycontin 15 BD and Norspan 20 patch. Panadine fort in the form of codeine, eight panadine fort per day will get you up around close to 50 milligrams. And with tapentadol, it's a little bit tricky because of the NRI and only partial mu agonist effect. But essentially the message is saying, prescribe above this level with caution. And I personally would love to see on every box of prescribed opiates, a morphine equivalent daily dose and some guides to our community so they understood. Coming to the end, um, in JAMA March of this year, this paper came out and it attracted a, a lot of attention. So they followed, uh, this group followed 240 patients over 12 months. They picked out people with uh, moderate to severe low back pain or hip or knee pain, and that is the common or garden uh, uh, conditions that affect people that lead to chronic pain in our community. Um, they prescribed opiates up to 100 milligrams a day, or the, alternatively, a non-opiate regimen, which included paracetamol, NSAIDs and adjuvants. They didn't exclude PTSD or depression. Um, they tried to make sure they included the community groups who uh, end up uh, presenting with chronic pain. And over the 12 months, they found that the overall functional impact on pain was similar. The pain intensity was somewhat less in the group who were on non-opioids at the end of 12 months, and the opioid group had higher adverse events. So this paper is quoted as one of those to suggest that, certainly probably for the moderate pain group, the role of opiates in the long term is not as clear cut as we used to think. Where should it sit? Well, where should opiates sit? When we look at our chronic pain patients and the people coming to you in the hospital setting, should they be on opiates or not? Have they had access firstly to self-management education and encouragement from their health professionals reassurance? Have they had a biopsychosocial assessment, a formulation and an explanation of their pain and some education again? Have they had access to the common self-management things with physical therapies, exercise regimen, psychology? And have they had a concurrent mental health disorder excluded with 40% uh, of the people coming through our doors having an untreated mental health disorder. 
Have they had adequate non-opioid analgesic trials? And in that setting, and if they've met those criteria, opiates do fit in. They may fit in as a functional outcome-based trial. It's going to be lowish dose, and it's going to be time-limited while improvement occurs. And there will be some people who will do very well like that, but that's a small subgroup. Deprescribing is really difficult, though. So we, despite the years of us learning and the messages going out and the very, very good education that's getting out into the community about opiates. Um, 90, 89% of GPs rarely or never um, terminate opioid prescriptions. And that was uh, similar to uh, uh, in the US when they looked at the Departments of Veterans Affairs, opiates only 80% um, are maintained at three and a half years. And opiate prescriptions initiated at discharge from our hospitals are frequently maintained for a whole number of reasons. And indeed, I mean, I think there's a term called the legacy patients, those people who've been on opiates for 5, 10, 15 years. It's going to be very, very difficult to get these people to taper. We need to have a harm minimisation approach and make sure uh, we support them and try and get them off, but that we may not be able to do that. We need to, when we prescribe, we need to follow the six A's to avoid the coroner and the medical board. Um, we need to review at each prescription analgesia levels, activity, affect, adverse effects, aberrant behaviours, and we need to document this accurately. Pam, uh, I always like to quote my uh, co-speakers, uh, Pam McIntyre, Chris Huxtable et al. mentioned about the costs and consequences of uh, discharge opiate prescribing from hospitals. Um, where we do recognise that over-prescribing and hoarding for later use occurs. We see that only about a third of the medicines at discharge ever get used and the remainder remain somewhere. People uh, leave hospital without adequate advice about driving. And with the GP community, it's, uh, we're often hearing from them that uh, the hospital has discharged the patient on opiates. They haven't given me a message about what to do. The patient is expecting this to be maintained. In fact, I got rung up by one of the GPs I work with um, in Wyala in country South Australia, who was waving the discharge summary, which said uh, oxycodone, immediate release, um, five to 20 milligrams hourly PRN sustained. <laughs> That was what was written on the discharge form. And the patient had come to him waving his discharge form at day, day four after discharge, saying, I've run out and I need to have four tablets of endone available, hourly PRN. Thank you very much, because that's what's on the hospital discharge. We got that fixed up. Um, so we really need to make sure that if we send people out of hospital on opiates, that we communicate adequately with the patient and the, their GP. And one of the other ones that comes up that's a bit disturbing is that this come, came out of JAMA surgery uh, last year. Persistent opioid use after minor and major surgery. So in the States, they managed to look through 36,000 surgeries in opiate naive patients, um, of which the majority, 80%, were minor operations. And it's three to six months, 6.5% 6 were still on opiates after major surgery and almost 6% after minor surgery, so the minor surgeries that we don't expect people to be maintained on opiates, 6% were still going. And why were they still on them or who was still on them? Those patients with a prior pain disorder uh, or a mood disorder or misuse. So it wasn't so much the surgical factors, it was patient factors. And the implication that the authors put up was that this should be regarded as an avoidable and underappreciated surgical complication and potentially medico-legal factors for those people who prescribe from the hospital setting, be it the surgeon or the anaesthetist. So coming back, and coming back to finish off, so we're going to anaesthetise this chap with the anaesthetist. We're going to look after him. He's clearly got some issues going on. What's our responsibilities here? Are we going to um, let it be, provide him with anaesthesia for this occasion, and then let him go back to the community? I think what we need to do is we need to be frank with a patient. It's pretty obvious that this guy uh, or this person's got problems. He may well have a pain complaint, but there's been clear misuse and there's been risks. And this person's use of their medications would appear to, to override, uh, has led to them to be close to death. Um, 
next time they could die from this. And this overrides dispensing take-home opioids uh, in that setting. Um, we need to clarify the prescription history of this person with our, straight, uh, with our state uh, health drug division, um, in Victoria at least, under the uh, real-time prescribing ERCITI model. We'll be able to do it electronically online, but to date in South Australia and most other states, you have to ring up the health department. Someone needs to discuss with a prescribing GP what's going on. And in fact, uh, I've, with similar cases that I've come across, the prescribing GP actually hasn't been aware that this has gone on and hasn't been informed that this has gone on. And so they are prescribing uh, in, in ignorance of these events. If we can, we get addiction medicine involved. And this person may well need to be on opiates, but it would be in the setting of Suboxone or Methadone under a daily pickup thing because there are clear risks with this person having boxes of opiate at home. They, have a, they may have a pain disorder, um, but they are clearly got a dependency disorder. Just to summarise, and thanks for your attention, dated opiate therapy for chronic and non-cancer pain um, would appear to have limited benefits and harms, but there will still be a small subset of patients in which it may be able to be maintained. Atypical opioids may have advantages over pure mu agonists, and, and Pam will talk about that uh, following this. But there's such shortfalls to access to non-pharmacal options in the community and this has driven problematic prescribing in pain management and hopefully as hospital practitioners we shouldn't contribute further. And just to throw in uh, something from the side, just be very, very careful with pregabalin as the amount of pregabalin being prescribed increases. We're seeing uh, increasing harms, uh, falls, broken bones, uh, cognitive issues, suicidality and uh, um, and only modest benefits in some of the patients. And I'll leave it at that point. Thank you.